Oops, let me get past the recording. Um, the goal of this session is really to get you started on an individual development plan, or if you already have one, to make some further progress. I also want to share a bit of research very briefly about the value of individual development plans and why they're so important to you as a first generation student or really a student from um, whatever community you're coming from. Let's see, it looks like I froze. We can still hear you though. You can. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm going to share my screen because that's just a scary looking um, shot of me. <laughs> okay. Let's do that then. And that'll be better. All right. Um, so uh, again, uh, as Sam mentioned, I'm the project lead for Imagine PhD, but I actually have been for um, 24 years, a, a career advisor. Um, I worked in the realm of professional development at the University of California, Davis. And in that role, I've served um, hundreds of graduate students and postdocs, probably thousands, but I've never really counted this up. And so I have worked with folks uh, on their career journey, also in working at success in their graduate school program or as a postdoctoral scholar. And I also am someone who did the grad student walk. I was a, um, a PhD student in geography and completed my degree many years ago now. And I've also been a postdoctoral scholar. So I have um, been on this journey and I'm really happy to be of any help that I can. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and without further ado, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. So as I get started, though, it'd be helpful for me if you don't mind dropping in chat or um, uh, yeah, chat's probably the best place. Can you tell me what, what year you are in your program? Are you just starting out? Are you um, been there a while? And also, have you ever done an individual development plan? So if you would drop that in chat, that would be wonderful. If it's more accessible, you can also unmute and let us know as well. Yeah, that's whatever works for you would be great. Ninth year program. Thank you for sharing that, Lenora. Great. Third year, first year, 10th year, no IDP, second year. This is really helpful because we've got a range of folks First, yeah, first year at all different stages in your graduate career. So that's terrific. Um, the IDP is useful at any stage. And if you've never done one, um, that's not a problem. Um, if you have done one, uh, you know, as you probably know, it's an iterative process. So we're always wanting to um, update it and revise it. So a bit about IDPs. So um, uh one thing that you'll want to think about is making a plan, of course, is an important part of graduate school. And I think we often get stuck in this idea of, okay, I've got a list, right? Probably all of you have a list next to your computer or some version of that on your phone that says the things you're going to do today, or you may not be a list person, that's okay too. But the idea of an individual development plan is really um, uh, to think about this over a timeline rather than just in the moment. And that is how it can be most effective for us. So a little bit about um, why, what it is and why it's important. For those who've never heard this term before, and that's not uncommon, I, I, work, I worked a lot with humanities and social sciences students, and an IDP is often very familiar in STEM, which I've also worked with a lot of STEM students, um, but not so much always in these other disciplines. So the idea behind an IDP is it's a written plan for professional development, where the I stands for your unique training and career goals. So these might be if you're a new graduate student, your program goals, the courses you're going to take, the D, the improvement or maturation needed to achieve those goals or improve those skills, and then a plan, specific steps and goals, usually to a timeline rather than just a random walk or the list that we tend to all rely on. So why does it make a difference? I just want to share a little bit um, about the rationale behind this. Well, we know that and research has shown that thinking about goals motivates people to pursue them. It also develops specific rather than general goals um, can help people achieve them. Uh, so if, if you have a very general goal, it's easy to get lost in the the thought, like I'll just make something up preposterous. Uh, I'm going to write my dissertation. Well, that's a goal, but that is huge, right? It needs to be broken down much further. 
Um, and then we also know that having um, a plan does a couple things for you. It helps uncover what you don't know, which a lot of times in grad school, we feel like we need to just know everything. And of course, we don't all know it. And if you're first generation, you may have even less access to that social capital that would help you know that. Um, and so IDPs really help uncover what's called the hidden curriculum in graduate school. I don't know if you've heard this term before, but it's the notion that there are rules and um, resources that you may not know about, never having been to grad school or never having had any family member who had been to uh, college or graduate school. So by putting together a plan, it can expose those gaps in your knowledge and it can also help your mentors know what resources or information you may need. And then finally, it introduces accountability to the process. So if you share this plan with your mentors, um, it gives you a little incentive to um, get things done. Um, and I'll give an example. Here at UC Davis, we have one of our counselors in the um, Counseling Center runs an accountability writing group. And it does not focus on the mechanics of writing or grammar or anything like that. Instead, it's a group of folks who get together and they commit to sharing a paragraph of their writing or what has happened um, since they last met. So it gives you a community of accountability. And I think that can be tremendously helpful um, because sometimes grad school can be very isolating. Now, some other research actually around IDPs and career planning, they found that folks who do um, and develop and implement strategies to pursue specific career goals achieve greater career success. And this was actually measurable by salary, promotions, and level of responsibility. And further, they found that these folks reported greater career satisfaction um, and rated themselves as more successful than their peers compared to those without a plan. So again, the value of planning is not just um, helping us get done, but it also actually helps us uh, advance and um, be successful. There was also a study of 7,600 postdocs that found those who developed training plans with their advisor at the start of their appointments reported greater satisfaction with the postdoc position, actually measurably had more published papers and wrote more grants and experienced fewer conflicts with their advisors. And I think in some ways this is, um, Intuitive, because of course, if you sit down, especially those of you who are new grad students, as you sit down with your um, new professor and work out a plan, um, you're on the same page. And that can be very helpful in and of itself. And then finally, in, from my research realm, um, in 2017, the University of California surveyed graduate students at all 10 of its campuses. And we're, they, we were looking at what well-being experiences graduate students were having. And we found that life satisfaction was correlated with career prospects. Um, now this may sound, um, this, can, this can be good and bad, right? If you think you know what your career prospect is, but it's gonna be difficult, that may seem like a, a challenge. But in fact, just knowing what career prospect you're shooting for can be um, extremely helpful in satisf satisfaction. On top of that, we found that satisfaction with career prospects and with mentorship and advising is correlated with being on time to complete the degree. And this again makes sense because if you're sharing your, um, your, your goals and your plans and getting the advising that you need, that's gonna help you complete more quickly. Now, that being said, I know how difficult that can be because not all of us have, are in the position that we wanna share our career plans with an advisor if we feel like it won't be well received or welcomed. And that makes sense. But that I think it's back to the idea that we always want to have multiple mentors, right? We never want to um, have a um, mentorship based on a single individual because that person can only help us in the ways that person knows. So I would always encourage you in graduate school to seek out multiple mentors and they may um, be different, right? You may have everything from professors to people in careers, maybe alums, maybe fellow grad students. I have to say some of the most valuable advice I received as a grad student was from my fellow grad students. And those of you who've been here a while probably have a similar experience. Okay, moving on, I wanna talk a bit about Imagine PhD and why we're going to use it. Because when you go to the tool, you'll see that it says um, for um, humanities and social sciences PhDs. But what I want you to know is that it's for people who are in all stages of their career, we have undergraduates who use it, um, master's students, PhDs, people who have gone on to careers, and we have people in all disciplines. So a third of our users are actually in the science, technology, engineering, and math fields. Um, and then about um, a third of um, social sciences and a third of humanities also. So, and a bit of other disciplines beyond that. 
So what is this tool? Well, and why am I leading this project? Well, really, this project stemmed out of an organization called the Graduate Career Consortium. And this is an organization of folks across the country who provide services to graduate students and postdocs. And so the person I know at your institution is Laura Schramm as one of our, our members, but I'm sure there are many others. And we realized there was not a tool um, for humanities and social sciences at this point that had um, the, the individual development plan and had more information about careers. So we set about creating one and our goal was for it to always be free to students. So it's not um, meant to charge anybody ever and uh, it's confidential. So we also wanted it to be a starting point rather than to sound like this is a fortune cookie or a crystal ball where somebody tells you this is the career you're going to do, but rather helps you uncover what are the things that interest you? What are your values? What are your skills? And how that might make a satisfact satisfactory career. We also included the goal setting application, which is the IDP part of this tool that enables you to map out the next steps for career and professional development. So I just wanted to share with you some of the folks who created this tool, some of the institutions rather, and University of Michigan is one of them. Um, but we had over 80 people from all of these institutions and organizations that basically volunteered to work on this tool to create a resource for you. Now, um, hopefully you're at a computer, have a phone, have a tablet, something to work with, but I'm gonna want you to log into Imagine PhD. I'm gonna talk more about individual development plans as we go along, but if you have not been on the site before, please do log in and create a profile. It's a very short process. And then hold up there. You'll be tempted to um, browse around, but hold up. <laughs> because we're going to do a couple things. We're going to do one of the assessments and we're going to do an individual development plan because again the goal for this brief session is to get you started and have something to take away. So in um, Imagine PhD which you're logging into there's something called my plan which is what we use to create an, your own individual development plan and this also encourage you, encourages you to do those specific rather than general goals that we talked about earlier that helps things be more successful and we really encourage you to think both in the short term and the long term, because graduate school can be a lengthy process. And I think some of the folks who chimed in in chat um, uh, pointed to that. For myself, um, it was from master's to PhD of 10 year process. It was quite long. So the tool actually gives you a seven year timeline to work with, but you can always keep adding to that. So. Um, that'll be a resource for you. And then we'll talk about um, career degree project and skill goal ideas, but you can really use this tool for any, um, any of the goals that you may have. And please feel free, if you have questions to unmute and chime in, I, I um, am getting through this material, but I'm really happy to answer questions. And I was telling Sam and Danielle that I'm happy to stay afterwards too, if there are more questions, but I really want to have you take something away from this opportunity that is the start of your plan. So this is what it looks like in the tool when you've signed up. There's this what's called the My Plan feature. And you'll see at the top, there's a big blue button that says add a new goal. And that's what you do. You click on that and you add your goal, the specifics around that. You can add a date or a date range. This is an, an old one from what I had before. And if you want, it will remind you. You can enable reminders so that it sends you an email asking you, you said this is the date of the end of the school or you know where are you at with that? Um, on the left side, you'll see something that says chart view. That's more of a calendar view. So you can actually see that seven year calendar. So you can either look at it as a list of activities or in that calendar view, you can, you can toggle back and forth and you can also check off as you complete these, which I don't know about you, but it's very satisfying to me <laughs> to be able to check stuff off my list um, and to know I'm making progress. And again, you can use this for any, you know, um, anything from a course, if you want to, where you know your outline is due at this point or a TA ship where you've got to put together the syllabus and, um, maybe you have grading to do, that sort of thing. However you'd like to use it, you'll see I dropped in a Zumba course, um, physical fitness, important. <laughs> so, um, and to be to mental health too. So also within um, Imagine PhD is a list of suggested goals. And I'm going to drop in chat the link to this just so you can um, uh, have it at your fingertips if you want it. Let me see if I can find chat again. Uh, Easier said than done. Oh, here we are. Okay. 
So I put this in a folder for you. And at the end of this presentation, I have a PDF of this entire presentation. So if you're like me, as someone who's a compulsive note taker, you don't need to do that. <laughs> I should have told you that earlier, um, but we'll have that available. So this, what you're looking at now is um, uh, a PDF off the site that just has some uh, suggestions for goals. And totally up to you if these are ones that you want to work on. I'm sure you'll think of some of your own, but we wanted to help people kind of noodle over what kinds of things they might want to add. Um, and as you'll notice, these are not all degree completion or career. There's also personal development or money or funding goals or skills development. I'm sure that you probably have some in mind that, that you might think of too in addition to these. Now, let's see. Maybe if I could see a show of thumbs up in the... Um, in the windows here, how many folks have heard of SMART goals? Anybody heard this term SMART goals? Okay, I got a thumbs up from Lenora and Shell and Mira, okay, let's see. Oh, several people, excellent, that is excellent. But I'm gonna go over it briefly for those who have never heard of it because I think it's one of the things that is essential um, uh, for uh, success, so. So I'm going to get back to where I was. Yep. Okay. So if you've heard this term SMART goal, why it's important, let me get back to my PowerPoint here. There we go. Um, it's really an acronym. And it looks like I've got, right? Sorry, just making sure that <laughs> you can see the whole screen. Okay. So where S stands for specific. So in other words, what in particular is the expected result. And I'm gonna show you a really simple example of this in a minute. The M starts stands for measurable. So how will you know when you've reached your goal? So what's your um, standard of it being done um, and completed? And sometimes that's a deadline, but sometimes not, particularly with a skills development goal, it may be um, how well you can do something at that point. Is it attainable? Is it practical and realistic? So my earlier example of, you know, I'm going to write my dissertation is certainly a goal, but it's too big of a goal to really be a SMART goal. It needs to be broken down into attainable portions um, that'll work. Is it a goal that you, is it attainable in the sense that you have the agency and the resources to do it? If not, you'll want to think about what do I need to be able to attain that goal? Relevant, how does it contribute to the larger or overarching goals of either your project or your skills development or degree completion? So again, um, relevant to the project. And finally, I think in some ways, one of the most important parts is when does it need to be completed? So what's the deadline? Um, because I don't know about you, but you know, deadlines can make me anxious, but on the other hand, not having them can really create a situation where, well, you know, what's another month or two or three. So um, having a time bound deadline is really important. So there are different, I've seen this um, parsed out different ways. So the A for you, if you've known SMART goals might be something slightly different, but this is, this is the, the meat of it, you know, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound or SMART. So my example is you're going to a conference, you need to submit an abstract. That's a goal, but it's not a SMART goal because it doesn't have the things we just mentioned. So we could make it a SMART goal by putting a timeline to it um, and then also putting tasks to it. So by five o'clock Friday, the 10th of November, I'm gonna review the call for proposals and write my 500 word abstract, but I'm also gonna share the abstract um, and revise it so that it's shareable, you know, clean up whatever typos or whatever I have in it, and then share with my colleagues, my professors to review. And then by the deadline for um, submission of the abstract, I will have incorporated their feedback and complete the online submission form. And as you probably know, you never wanna wait till the deadline on a form <laughs> because that's dangerous. Um, but anyway, but by then it would be done. So that's an example of smart goal setting. So when we think about the make a plan, which we just talked about, one of the things that can be helpful for us in setting goals is self-assessment, is evaluating where we are in the process of our graduate program, what skills we might want to develop, what interests we might want to pursue. So when we talk about career exploration, these are really the, this is really the, 
I guess I would say unending cycle, if you want to think about it that way, you can jump in anywhere. But um, with a self-assessment, you can explore your options, narrow them, make a plan, or you can just start with making a plan, then do some self-assessment. So I want to take some of the time we have this afternoon to do one of the self-assessments in Imagine PhD. But first, I want to talk a little bit more about what these are. So um, ideally, in, in career exploration, you'll want to look at your skills. So what are you good at and like doing on a daily basis? And if you're just starting grad school, this is what you're here to build, right? You, you may be, you may already have some of these and you're gonna hone them, or you may be developing entirely new sets of skills that you've never used before. Um, and so that's, that's important to think about. Um, the other one is interests. In your working life, what do you spend most of your time on now and how would you prefer to spend your work time? And again, if you're starting grad school, this is all something that you're ramping up for this. If you've been here a while, you probably have a better sense of, do you like TA? Do you like to teach? Do you like to do research? Um, do you like to, you know, what is it? You know, uh, volunteer with agencies that need your support, public speaking, thinking about how you like to spend that time when I worked at the Career Center um, in the early part of my career, I would have grad students come in and say, you know, I, I'm not sure that I have any, any skills. And like, um, and I'd say, of course you do, tremendous skills. But they'd also say, I just don't know what jobs I'd want. Is there a list of jobs for an English PhD? And I would say, well, there may be lists, but what if you're not interested in those things? Because occasionally I would come across folks who would say, I don't like to do research or I don't like to teach. I really never want to teach again. So I would say if there's some um, magical list of jobs, but it doesn't um, capture your interests, that's not for you, right? So we want to have a more personalized experience of that career exploration and planning. And then values. What's the most important in your work environment and why? And a lot of times people hear values and they get uneasy. They think this is something to do with my, you know, um, uh, if I have any spiritual beliefs or beliefs about how people should behave. And it's not that. It's really thinking more about what's important to you. So is it important to you that you work in an environment that values diversity? Is it important to you that it's intellectually challenging? Do you want it to be a very competitive environment? Would you prefer it be slower paced? Do you want to work an eight to five job? Those are all values that you'll want to consider as you're as you're thinking about your career. So Imagine PhD has assessments for all three of these. Today we're going to uh, concentrate on skills, but I highly encourage you to do the other ones too. And to you can take these assessments as many times as you want. Um, it stores your results up to the you know the the three that you just did, and then the fourth one it starts to kick the old result out. But I think it's really valuable. You can go back and look at that and um, see what um, what you uh, said the last time. So before we do the skills assessment, as I mentioned, we're going to do in a minute, it's going to ask you to select up to 10 job families. So let me skip forward a slide and tell you what we're talking about here. So there are 16 job families in this particular tool, and they cover a variety of, of opportunities from higher ed um, administration, which is what my career has been, um, to faculty, to research and analysis, um, advocacy. So you can see all of these and see what they say. So there'll be a brief description of each and you can select um, the ones that interest you. You don't have to select 10. Um, in terms of uh, the time we have here today, probably one or two is great and you can go back and select some others. Now, if you're really clever, you probably notice that, hey, wait, I, I believe I said there's 16 job families, um, but there's only 15 bubbles. So faculty is broken into research intensive and um, teaching intensive. So that's actually two job families kind of packed into one there. Um, and this tool is not just an alt-ac or careers beyond academia tool. It's really meant to be to help you with the, the full array of careers that are available to you as a graduate student. Okay, going back. So this is what you're gonna see. It'll say, uh, it'll give you a brief description of these job families and you can click to save that job family. So again, hopefully um, you can log in now uh, well, wait, hold up one sec. Let me just show you a little bit more and then I'm going to turn it over to you and give you about seven minutes to work on this. So the skills assessment is going to ask you to drag and drop these skills into the following categories. I've never done this. I've done this in limited ways. I have more experience with this, but still need guidance. I can do this and I can do this well. So as you think about each skill, um, and maybe it's a skill that doesn't really matter to you. It's never, you know, if it doesn't matter, it's not a bad thing. You've never done it or, or you know, done it in limited ways. If you're a new grad student, there should be no expectation that you've done some of these things at all, 
or you know have done um, uh, or could do without um, guidance at this point. So that's what that's going to look like for you. And then um, let me just, I'll stop talking now. I'm gonna give you seven minutes. So please go on to imaginephd.com, um, create a profile. And then at the top of the screen, you'll see that there is a menu where you can select assessments, select the skills assessment and go from there. And I'll be here if you have any questions, you can um, either uh, speak out loud or, or chat. Okay, we're going to gather back together. And I apologize that my camera doesn't work. I'm really confused. That's why. <laughs> but I think the only way I could fix it would be to log out and come back in. So I'm going to just hang out here and, and be a dark screen. I apologize about that. But um, anyway, how was that experience for folks? You can drop in chat or um, was it pretty straightforward? Did you um, learn anything you didn't know? I learned a whole different bunch of ways I can define skills. Excellent. Can you give an example, Lenora? Yeah. I mean, I think I literally, uh, I, I think even with some of the ones that were just like research and analysis, like I wouldn't have thought of like comprehend large amounts of information as like a skill that like would go on like. I mean, not necessarily on a resume, but would be in like my bucket for things or um, interpretation of data. I think I have a really broad view of like a lot of those like skill families. Like, mm -hmm. so like I think of like qualitative research as like this, like uh, as like containing like all of those things, but being able to disaggregate it helps me see it as my skills as being more flexible. I think that's great. Your your comment goes back to that uh, comment I had about the grad student who came into my office and said I had no skills. And I thought it's so seldom that we unpack our skills in graduate school. Um, and we just see these job descriptions and they have like, you know, something very specific. Um, but you do have tremendous skills. You're coming into grad school with skills and you're only going to hone them further and um, make them stronger. Um, and let's see, Kelly mentioned uh, going into chat now that it was straightforward, but sometimes I had a hard time self-assessing my strength in that skill. That is a, a problem for everybody, Kelly, um, and is actually why we we changed. We, we had like a scale where it's like, I'm very good at this or not so good at this. And that's why we went to this, this terminology about I've never done this before or I've done it somewhat. And I think that's okay. I think, again, you, you don't have to share this with anybody. It's more for your self-assessment to think, this is, um, or I think I'm strong in this area, or maybe I need a little more work. Um, and I think that confidence grows with time. Uh, but uh, yeah, so thank you for sharing that. And then Hira, I hope I'm saying your, your name correctly. Um, please unmute if I'm not. Uh, it was pretty good. Help me explore more stuff Imagine PhD can give, like looking at jo into job families and the resources to improve specific skills for that job family. Yes, that's one of the things that I hope you'll discover too. The job families have a ton of resources, which we're not going to talk about today because we have limited time. But if you go dive into those, there's everything from tip sheets to example resumes to um, uh, these job simulations where you can try out skills and jobs. Um, so that's, um, that's great. Thank you all for sharing those comments. So now that we've done the skills assessment, let me get back to my deck here. You probably see something like this and just realize the ones at the end of the chart that say I can do this well are your strengths um, or I can do this. These are all strengths. Again, if you're new in grad school, you may not have developed these. And as you look at the job families that you selected, let me go on to that. Well, uh, wait, let me back up. So you can also sort these by type of skill if you choose to do so. That So that's what this slide is showing you. But when you look at the job families that you were interested in, here's higher ed um, administration as an example. Uh, you'll see that the top five skills are skills that expert rating. So they looked at each job family and determined which skills were essential to that job family. Um, all of them may be used in some way, but these are the ones that are most important. And they'll compare your answer with um, what's important for that job family. So then you're able to see where you have alignments. Um, there's also the green splotches that you'll see where there's some misalignments. 
And what this can help you do is think about, well, as I'm making an individual development plan, maybe I need to get better at navigating difficult conversations. That seems to be important for this job family. So what are my resources for that? Is there a workshop on that? Is it something that I can learn from someone who's really skilled at that? Um, so again, it, it can help prompt you to think about how you might do your skills development. And then the blue arrow that points to view the full list of skills. Remember you did like 60 some odd skill sorting. So these are only five of them <laughs> for each job family. So you'll want to expand that so you can see all of them. And then also on the right, your answer in the expert rating, you can sort by your answer. So you can see the highest um, ones to the lowest or by the expert rating, either one works. So that can all be a tool for you. Um, let's see, uh, just checking chat. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kate, for coming. Um, appreciate it. Uh, and let's see, going back to um, our slide deck here, a bit more about this and how you can use it. So again, here's one. I picked one that was really preposterous for me. I wish I were good at languages. Oh my gosh, I really wish I had that skill, but I am not. So I picked translation interpretation and Key skills for this would, as you might imagine, be communicating in other languages. So this is to show you, here's a spot um, where obviously my answer, I don't have that skill. If this was a job family I wanted to work in, I know I would need to take courses and develop that and um, do better. On the other hand, communicating content to a general audience is a skill that I have. And so I have an alignment for this job family. So that's just to show you how um, the results look and what you might want to do with those. Now, I want to move on to actually doing the IDP part of the IDP, um, which is helping you think about um, your, your goals that you want to do. They might be degree completion or skills completion goals. And let me see if I can just drop the URL and chat to this, um, uh, to this particular worksheet. Yeah, so you should be able to pull up a worksheet in, in Google Docs. Um, that you can then um, modify. Uh, so please download it before you modify it so you're not sharing your goals with everybody, <laughs> unless you, you plan to. And then what you can do is put in your goals, whether that be, oops, sorry, degree completion goals or skills development goals. And then on the, the second page of that form, if you printed it out, it'd be on the back of the form, you'll see that there is language about um, the milestone activity and the date. So what I'd like you to do here is pick one goal. Now, it can be one of the skills that you just saw that you want to develop, or it can be a degree completion goal. You know, maybe you're just starting out, maybe you're in year seven or eight, and you're thinking about, I really need to do X or Y and Z. So again, um, I'm gonna give you five minutes, so this is really a quick, um, quick work part, but to grab one goal and map out the activity for that. So whatever is top of mind for you or what seems important. So let's go ahead and get started. And again, download that form so it's on your computer. Okay, so hopefully you're, you've started on that. If you have even one goal that you've mapped out and, and done the SMART goal setting, right? The um, specific, measurable, attainable, um, realistic, and time-bound, that's fabulous because if you have not done an IDP, you have now started one. <laughs> and so what I, I want to talk a bit more about um, how that can be valuable and what you can do with this tool. So um, the worksheet is, is helping you identify these skills and really the brainstorming part of it is super important. So I've seen people do this different ways, like you know map it out on a whiteboard or on this sheet of paper or however that works for you. But one of the things I found extremely helpful is sharing it with your colleagues and mentors for advice because that's when you um, help solidify those goals and think about, you know, to um, I think Shell's point, like sometimes it's impossible to break down these huge goals, but as you talk with other folks, if that can help you really conceptualize that and think about how you can make that work for you. But one of the most valuable things about having this worksheet or putting together an IDP is being able to share it with your mentors because resources come your way. Um, in other words, it's very easy to be in a grad program for um, a year or even a number of years and not know which questions to ask and then not know what you need. So the IDP can be an, an invaluable tool for that. The other thing you want to think about is how you hold yourself accountable. So that's great. You've got a plan, 
but um, what can work in terms of accountability? I would say with projects, asking a mentor or friend to meet with you at the milestone deadlines. My major professor did this with me. He, he would say, okay, here's the deadline. We're going to have coffee that day. <laughs> and he didn't mean that as a threat, but sometimes it could feel like, oh my goodness, well, okay, so that then has to be done. But you can do this in an informal way where you just say to somebody, um, I need to have this paragraph done for um, the abstract and I, I need it on this date. So I'm going to make a, a, um, a, create a meeting with you so that we um, can meet and I can actually check that off my list. For skills that's a little trickier, they aren't always time-based, right? I mean, you try to put a time, but it's more general in, in notion. This might be thinking about how you will assess when you've accomplished the skills development goal. So is it a series of workshops? Is it in terms of language being fluent or just reading ability? Whatever that might be, thinking about um, how you will hold yourself accountable in that sense. And then with the IDPs, I think the mistake people make with them is, uh, as we do sometimes with a resume or CV, we, we want to take that out once every two years and then update it. And an IDP is a living document. So it is only as good as what you put into it. And you will want to um, share it, implement it, and keep revising your plan. So put the plan into action, review it regularly with whoever, you know, if you're not comfortable reviewing it with your um, professor, find another mentor or colleagues. Um, and you don't have to sit there with a piece of paper. If you know what's in it, you can also share it that way. It can, it can be informal. It doesn't have to feel like this, this big formal process. And then revise the plan as necessary. Again, this is getting back to the idea you check things off, but also things change. You know, I don't, um, for me, my study site changed. I had two study sites for the dissertation and one proved to be impractical. So we ended up changing to a different one. Well, that needed a whole new set of plants. You know, I did survey work. So where I was going to go, how that was going to work, that sort of thing. And then you will hear people say, do an annual IDP. Well, I agree, but a lot happens in 12 months, right? Like, I don't know about you, but that thing would look completely different and be so much harder to work on. So even better is at least quarterly during the year or even more often than that. Um, so again, it's an opportunity to check things off um, and uh, make progress. So I also wanted to mention to you some other IDP tools because um, Imagine PhD is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm biased, so I'm, <laughs> I'm a fan, but if you are in STEM, um, also one that's been out there quite a while is my IDP. And when I share the slide deck, all of these are hyperlinked so that you can go to these different sites. Um, my IDP covers a lot of the sciences, not so much engineering, um, and not health sciences, um, as thoroughly, but it, it could be useful. It also does the three assessments. Uh, they have their own versions of the assessment and they have their own careers that they map to. There's a brand new one called FAS IDP, which is uh, public health and social sciences. And it concentrates on those, um, uh, fields and, uh, is one that you can, again, go look and see what resources they have. And then finally, chem IDP is the chemical sciences, everything from engineering to physics to that sort of thing. So, um, that may be one that's of interest to you if you're in any of those disciplines. And then finally, I just want to give you my contact information and answer any questions you have. I hope that you'll continue your journey with your IDP and share it. And I think great things will come of that for you. Um, but please let me know if you have any questions. And I think I'm going to turn off my slides to see if that will maybe get my um, camera back. Well, let's just see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or not. <laughs> I am the mysterious box, um, but I am here and happy to answer questions. Thank, Thank you for your kind comments. Yeah. Thanks for the comments in chat too. I appreciate it. So as y'all gather your thoughts, um, we've placed our evaluation survey in the chat. Could you please just do me a favor and open the link so that you have the tab ready and waiting for you so that we can continue to improve our programming for you. Um, yes, does anyone have any questions for Teresa? Teresa, I have a question. Sure. So how much time do you think we need to dedicate to developing our IDP the first time? I would say I would set aside at, at least 90 minutes to get started. Okay. 
Um, and I think that question may also depend on where you are in your grad career. So it might go quicker earlier in your career because you're you're concentrating at the beginning on your courses, when you're going to take them, what, what you need for those. But I would always set aside that much time. And then to revise it, um, it really depends, like depending on what projects you're tackling. Um, but what I just um, encourage people to do is not to look at it as a chore, but as like a form of self-care <laughs> is mm. what I see you know, where you can map out what you need to do and um, and really see what resources are missing. I, I can't tell you how many times I, I've talked to people and they, once they share the plan, it's more apparent what they don't know. And um, I think it's important, you know, it's it, it feels a little vulnerable not to know something, but that's how you get that hidden curriculum, that information from other folks. So share with who you feel safe with, and then you can progress to share with your, you know, your faculty mentor um, if you feel a little less safe with them. Thank you. Sure. Um. Another question. So if I placed in my skills development goals, goals that aren't academically specific, but are more personal, are those goals that I also share with my advisor? Um, or do I am I only sharing my academic goals with my advisor? So I would share what I would share with people those goals that you need either accountability for or you need help with. Um, and so my example earlier was about career um, goals. I've uh, I've advised grad students who have a career goal they don't think their major professor would support. And so that might not be the person that you share that goal with that may feel like a personal goal to you. Um, again, I, the purpose of the IDP is to get support and resources. And so I never, I don't like this idea of, you know, ever forcing anyone to share something they don't want to share. I, I think that's counterproductive. And in fact, with my IDP, it, um, some of the science grants require people to do that IDP and then sh um, share that they did it with their advisor, but they quickly learned that they could not ask people to share all the results. People were very sensitive about that. So um, I would say the other thing that is valuable is not to share everything at once. Like, can you imagine any advisor is going to be overwhelmed if you share your seven year plan and every detail, pick the piece that you need to share and you need support around. Okay, thank you. I appreciate sure. that. Sure. And if no one has um, any other questions, I have a final one. What if we're not hitting our deadlines? How do we navigate the IDP if the milestones may they may be being accomplished, but perhaps not by the deadlines that we have set? And maybe we're just feeling the IDP is reminding us of the failure. The oh no, no, yeah, that's a great question, Sam. So when I'm not hitting my goals, I think about why. So let's see. Kelly said, "I feel that especially after COVID delays." Well, that's right. COVID has delayed your progress. So rather than it being a bludgeon or something that makes you feel bad about yourself, that's not how I would use it. I would think, what's holding me back? What's holding me back in this particular area? And sometimes when you ask yourself that honest question, um, it it's different for everybody, but it may be you don't have the resources you need. It may be there is illness in the family. It may be that you're not feeling enthusiastic about this part of the project. Um, asking yourself that can kind of uncover maybe where your roadblocks are. So rather than us beating ourselves up for having roadblocks, how about if we just uncover them and think about what does that say in the larger picture? And is there something I need to do about it? Is it you know, I don't know about you, but I TA'd a lot when I was a grad student. And so it cut down on my time to do writing and research. And I realized, why am I so slow? Because I'm TAing every minute, right? So I needed to carve out some space um, with other resources to just have time to write. So maybe asking yourself those questions from a, a, a place of kindness rather than um, uh, condemnation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. All right. So that's the time that we have today. Um, Teresa, I want to thank you so much for sharing both your time and your wisdom 
with us. And I thank you to your, our audience members for your participation and your presence here today. Teresa has left her contact information and please again, reach out to our evaluation survey so that we can, can continue to improve these programs for you. Okay, thanks Thank you.